Good morning, baseball fans. It is Sunday, November 3rd. Look at me getting the month right. I'm very proud of myself. I am Susie. That is Kelsey. This is Bourbon and Baseball, all the balls edition, and away we go. I know we haven't spoken on the microphone since the actual World Series ended, Kels. We're going to recap that. We're going to recap some other stuff as well. But first, I have to give you guys the rated R warning, obviously, because this is a rated R podcast, not suitable for tiny ears, maybe some grown up ears, if that's not your jam. And that's okay. Just skedaddle on out of here to another podcast, another sports podcast that is less fun and less entertaining. I don't know. I don't want to toot my own horn. I don't want to toot your horn, Kels. We're a good time over here on the Bourbon and Baseball Show. So again, if Four letter words and inappropriate adult humor is not your jam. Then ski that on out of here and away we go. So Susie, this is, I think, the toughest week of the year for fans like us because we are having to experience all of the political ads and football with no baseball. At least before we were seeing like football was on, the political ads were on during the World Series, but at least there was baseball. And this is the week where there's not games happening. There's not a whole lot of like trade and, you know, obviously free agent signings can't happen quite yet. So if we can get through this week, we can get through anything. So I'm glad we're here to push through it together. But let's talk about that that World Series, because last time we spoke, the Dodgers were up two games to none, but we were headed to the Bronx, and yeah, it didn't last too much longer after that. Did you think that at that point it was going to be a short series? Was the writing on the wall, or were you surprised by just how quickly the Yankees spiraled and gave it all up? I'm not really surprised by anything the Yankees do at this point in time because they're just really not that good of a club of course I am shocked and surprised what what are you talking about no I wanted and like you and I had discussed I wanted a long series I wanted to go seven games because more baseball right? right I didn't care who won who lost technically I did care because I wanted to see more shirtless Kevin Kiermaier pictures however I just wanted all of the baseball I wanted really really good games and I guess, depending on how you look at it, we got some really good games, right? We had some very memorable moments from the games and from the series as a whole. That game four, man, let's just start with game four. Let's just start there. Game four backs up against the wall. At that point, I'm like, are they going to, they're going to at least win one, right? It can't be just, the Dodgers just can't sweep the Yankees. Well, it was the Dodgers, it was the Dodgers bullpen game too. So you were like, yeah, if, I, I think the Dodgers had accepted to some extent that probably to ultimately win the series, they were okay with conceding that game yeah. for if that's what had to happen. And it did. So at least we got, yeah. yeah, one extra game. A little a little bit of something. The first inning happens, obviously. Dodgers, Freddie Freeman, Superman himself hits a two-run home run. And I'm all, oh, where have I seen this before? Oh, just right. a copy it literally felt from... like, are we replaying last yeah. night's game? Yep. And and then the craziness of the, the fan interference. What are we doing here, people? What are we actually doing here? And yeah. for people, for Yankee fans that are saying, oh, that's just the, that's just Yankee fan base and that's just the Bronx. There was a contingent of people that, that said, no, absolutely not. We do not lay hands on yeah. players. <laughs> absolutely. But then there's also the other contingent of, no, that's just the, that's just the Yankee fan base and that's the Yankee way we're and the two fans that were patrolling quote unquote patrolling that wall that talked about these type of instances where they're going to do anything to help what are you doing sir absolutely fucking no, not. you're a spectator no. by the way yeah. you are by no means that's not a part of home field advantage because yeah. by the way it's against the rules <laughs> yeah. that's not yeah, no, that is not play. anything no you don't do that you don't literally grab the right fielder's wrist there is right open their mitt yeah. there is absolutely no scenario in which grabbing and, and forcing another human being period is okay um definitely not in and the fact that it happened on tv like that and now it is being glorified by some people man and my first thought was like how fucking terrifying to be mookie Betts in that moment and thank god yeah. he didn't appear to be injured in any way shape or form but man it could have been so much worse than it was it could have affected the game so much more than it did Mm -hmm. and anybody who's glorifying that or celebrating it in any way check yourself because yeah yeah, just really not cool and totally different than i guess we we talked in last week's episode about the fan reaching out in the game at dodger stadium and catching Mm -hmm. the ball totally different 
than that. Yes, that was still some level of fan interference, but at least more of a genuine reflex, like a thing of where you're like, I don't know, did I reach too far or not? Obviously was not looking to cause harm to anyone, just being an excited spectator. So totally different thing. But yeah, I've heard a lot of people talking about it. And I think we all can agree we've never seen anything like it. And we all should also be able to agree that we should never see anything like it again. <laughs> yeah. Do not put your hands on a player and just be glad that it's Mookie Betts and not Tommy Pham. Because had it been Tommy Pham, you would have had to stop the game because yeah. there would have been bloodshed. There yeah. would have been actual <laughs> bloodshed. And I'm all, Mookie Betts, and all credit to Mookie Betts because he he was just like, that. that's out. What are we doing? A. And then just tried to keep going with the game. I'm all, Mookie Betts, you are a professional, sir, and I give yeah. you all of the gold stars because at no point in time had I been out there, we no, we would have thrown hands, mm -hmm. absolutely thrown hands. Yeah. If you are, for some reason, thinking that you're giving your team an advantage, no, no, you are not, absolutely not. And then I really only think that the Yankees did not allow them back into game five was because of the media scrutiny that it was getting. Yeah, that was also very odd because I, I get it that they're season ticket holders, but that doesn't... <laughs> changed anything yeah <laughs> like, in fact that should have been the first thing that was like addressed with them upon making them leave the stadium is, and by the way don't come back <laughs> yeah that's and the fact that they went to the bar across the street and people were asking for pictures and asking for their autographs blew my mind that's how was, we were yeah it's like the same subset of people that we were talking about last week that were cheering when Shohei Otani got hurt like, yeah just yeah. absolute we ridiculousness Yankees fans yeah. so by no means yeah. are we putting you all in that box, but it is a no. real shame to see that kind of behavior and then have people egging it on even worse. Yeah. Like I said, the score was two to zero in the second inning. Austin Wells hits a solo home run, cuts the deficit down to two to one. Third inning, Anthony Volpe hits a go ahead grand slam. And a part of me, the baseball loving part of me, loved the story, loved the storyline going back to him being a what was it, a nine-year-old, eight-year-old at the yeah. parade, the 2009 yeah. parade. and the parade in 2009, yeah. That was super cute. And here he is playing for his favorite team, hitting the Grand Slam, and you're like, oh my gosh, they're going to do it. They're going to they're gonna do it, and that's, and I love it. Third inning, it's five to two. In the fifth inning, Freddie Freeman hits a second two-run home run, because of course he does, and now it's five to four. Sixth inning, Glaber Torres hits a home run. And I'm like, did, did we get the Goldilocks balls in this game? Yeah. <laughs> did someone forget to close the door to the humidor? Why? Okay, that's fine. That's all right. We wanted a high-scoring game. We got the high-scoring game. Yeah, so now... I know we were at Yankee Stadium, yeah. but it was cold that night. That was yeah. the one night, really, that it was a chilly World Series game. Glaber Torres hits a so another solo home run. And now it's 6-4 to four Yankees in the eighth inning. Alex Verdugo with an RBI single, increasing the lead to 7-4. Gleyber Torres hits a three-run bomb. It's 10-4. to four. Aaron Judge hits an RBI single. Aaron Judge! Four. With some offense coming alive! Yeah. And now the really fun stat of Zach Greinke has more hits than Aaron Judge in a World Series game is no longer a thing because... Uh, had to smash that out. Or, yeah, congrats, Aaron Judge, for being a better hitter than Zach Greinke in a World Series. Listen, I'm glad that... I'm glad that he got a little bit of action in the end there because that's just a really unfortunate narrative. But yeah, if they had had to play more games and Aaron Judge was hot, we would have seen a potentially a very different we, series. Yes, for sure. And when this debacle essentially happened, we talked about it. Brent Honeywell went out there and literally gave his arm for this game. <laughs> Dave Roberts said, sorry, Brent Honeywell, you're just going to wear it. Yeah. And I think he pitched, I think like his total line was like 55 pitches or something like that. It was, and that was an in and inning people. Yeah. You're like, Susie, he's pitched that, that much before. Not in an inning, not in one single inning. Mm -mm, nope. But no, because at that said, point it was like, yeah, we're looking not at the game. We're looking at the series again. And uh, yeah, here's what's going to have to happen. Everyone. And by everyone, I mean, Yankee fans were riding high and they said, you know, well, oh, don't let the Yankees get hot. Don't let Aaron Judge get hot. You allowed Aaron Judge to get hot. In game five, they said, JK, we're going to, we're not going to do that. And it seemed like it was going to be that way, though, because the Yankees came out hot. Yankees came out real hot. And Jack Flaherty, I don't know exactly what is going on with Jack Flaherty. That's going to be another off season mm -hmm. discussion. Mm -hmm. But it's every other game that Jack Flaherty pitches is a gem. But mm -hmm. the ones in between, it's not so good. 
is not so yeah. good. And the yeah, I've got a handful of theories five. watching him for many years now, but. Yeah. Oh my gosh, Susie. I was so sad because I'm a Jack Flaherty fan as a Cardinals fan. I was excited to watch him make a second big start, especially after his game one start was great. Mm -hmm. And I took the dog. We always eat dinner and then we walk our one dog that loves to walk. So we took a a quick walk with her because I was like, we'll get back by like the second inning. Won't miss much of the game. Uh, But I missed Jack Flaherty's entire start, unfortunately. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. That's did not fare well. Did not fare well, Jack Flaherty. Just did and not have it. Yeah. I don't, again, I don't know. I don't know why. I don't know what it is. Again, that'll be an offseason discussion, but he didn't have it. And the first inning, Aaron Judge, like I said, he got hot and he got locked back in. However, the ball that he hit out to give the Yankees a 2 0 lead was no joke, literal middle. Yeah. Couldn't put it in the middle of the square, you know, how the, or excuse me, rectangle is nine boxes, three lines. Literal, if it was the tic-tac-toe box, it was the literal middle. When yeah. I say middle, middle, that actual middle of them all. Yeah. Do we think anyone else has thrown a ball right there to Aaron Judge all season long? Probably not. Not intentionally, that's Probably for not. sure. Mm-mm. And I was all, wow, all right. I knew that Aaron Judge wasn't locked in, but I'm 94% sure that if he missed that, we're all, it, there's no hope for anybody. And he, no, nope, he sent that to the moon. And literally, next batter, Jazz Chisholm. I was like, hey, he can do it. I can do it too, right? Now it's 3-0 and you're all, all right, what's what's happening there? And you're like, all right, that that's that sounds good. I love that. Love that for them. And then they tack on a couple more runs. And by the fifth inning, it's 5-0. to zero, And you're like, all right, we got ourselves a game, guys. We got ourselves a game. It's going back to Kelly, Kelly. And then the Dodgers and their scouting report. And their scouts said, hey, guys, remember what we said? Remember that we said the Yankees were the worst defensive team? Not only are they the worst at base running, no, they're the worst defensive team. Fundamentals? Lacking in fundamentals? The Yankees? Who would have, who has been, who would have ever thought? Who's been saying that? I just, I don't even know. (laughs) Surely not us. No, definitely not us. Definitely not us, no. This and... is why I still stand by, Susie. I know I said at the beginning of the season or like in our preseason preview that I did not think the Yankees would be in the World Series. And I still stand by it because this is exactly why I said it as we got closer and closer to the end of the season. I described it as like smoke and mirrors is mm-hmm. kind of their team makeup. And I still fully believe that. And I think we saw that completely put on display and the Dodgers were able to really expose them for exactly the, the way that the team is built. <laughs> Absolutely. And it is, it wasn't great. Let's chat about, let's chat about that fifth inning. Now up until I want to say the third inning, Garrett Cole looked like he was locked in and I'm pretty sure he had a perfect game going until the third inning until I think Mm -hmm. was it the fourth inning? Mm Because I know that he had a perfect game going and then he had a no hitter going. Oh yes. He had the no hitter going until at least the fourth, maybe even the fifth. Fourth, Yeah. But that fifth inning, oh boy. Oh boy, that fifth inning just unraveled, unraveled. And I want to not be petty about Garrett Cole and everyone that knows me knows the kind of pettiness I have against Garrett Cole. And it really all stems back from that 2019 World Series where he was salty that he didn't get put in at the end of the game. And it was his free agency year. And he came out for the interview in a Scott Boris hat. And he said that he was an agent for himself or of himself. And it just left a really bad taste in my mouth. Yeah. And I just, I wasn't a fan. And then all of the stuff happened, the excuses basically for everything, for the sticky stuff, for just for, for all of it. Right. And I was like, okay, whatever, fine. But just the, the, the teensiest part of me, and by teensy, I mean a lot, a big part of me, was cackling, cackling at the fact of this fifth inning that just just got away from him he was he was cruising and then some defensive again miscues happened Aaron Judge with a fly ball and apparently that was his first error of the season wow first error of the season and by no means is is Aaron Judge the greatest center fielder of all time he's a very he's very solid average to good center fielder Mm -hmm. that's a that is a fly ball that he makes 99 out of 100 times right that's just the one time apparently where he literally took his eye off the ball clanked and you're all that's gonna hurt right that's surely Garrett Cole will we'll get out of this you cannot give the Dodgers extra outs people you cannot do it cannot no way not with that lineup 
And yeah, this is how quickly it unraveled. Kike Hernandez got the first hit in the top of that fifth. That was the first hit that Garrett Cole had allowed. Next thing you know, Tommy Edmond reaches on that air by Aaron mm-hmm. Judge. Then Will Smith <laughs> reaches on a fielder's choice. Now the bases are loaded. Gavin Luck strikes out. Shohei mm-hmm. Otani strikes out swinging, but they're not safe yet because the, the, this is the thing where once again, just that we saw in the NLCS and in the first couple games at Dodger Stadium, if you can't get Tommy Edmond out, you're screwed when he's mm-hmm. in that nine spot in the order. If you don't get Tommy Edmond out, this is where all of the trouble starts because then Mookie Betts comes in. He singles to Anthony Rizzo. Kike Hernandez scores. Tommy Edmond goes to third. Will Smith to second. And then we just keep seeing more and more defensive mistakes. Do you think the catch by Aaron, the missed catch by Aaron Judge was worse? Or do you think Garrett Cole then later on in this inning missing covering first base? Which one? No, Garrett Cole. Was worse. Garrett Cole. Garrett Cole. For sure. Garrett Cole. Because had he gotten out, had he run to first, had he covered first, like you were taught from Pee Wee Baseball, he would have been out of that inning five to three. He would have been out of that Still inning five lead. to three. Mm-hmm. Still would have had the lead. And like we said, he was cruising. And I'll give Garrett, Garrett Cole his flowers. I will. Because he did. He ended up coming back out after that disastrous inning and pitched two more innings. And he looked solid. He mm-hmm. looked great. Mm-hmm. But had he just covered first, had he just covered first, he would have been out of that inning. Would have been different. Yeah. He would have been on a plane to LA. And who knows what would have happened after that. But the fact that he did not cover first... What are we doing here, Garrett Cole? The fact that you stopped mid-play. You didn't even attempt to cover first. I realize that it's Mookie Betts running to first, and at no point in time am I thinking that Garrett Cole is going to win a foot race against Mookie Betts, but you could have made the effort. You could have at least tried. And apparently, again, I don't watch every single Yankee game, but apparently all of the Yankee games that Anthony Rizzo was at first base, at no point in time does Anthony Rizzo come marching in, charging in, and run to first. He expects the pitcher to cover first. Yeah. So the fact that Garrett Cole just stopped, Anthony Rizzo had the wonky spin off the ball or whatever. He's he's not covering. He's not going to first. Anthony Rizzo is not going to first. Garrett Cole, you needed to go to first base. I don't care that you thought Anthony Rizzo was going to do it. No, go to first. Go to first. Make the effort to go to first. And then the interview after with him just really truly cemented my disdain for Garrett Cole because the fact that he didn't take he didn't take blame for that did not take blame for it and he was like you know I guess it's both our faults no motherfucker no it was scored as a hit which is really interesting I I didn't think it was but it It, it well because they said that it, it was a mental it was a mental miscue or whatever from Garrett Cole because if Anthony Rizzo had like kind of dived to first or if Gary Cole had gone to first, then a play could have been made. It's Mookie and he's booking it. So they scored it as a hit. It may be overturned. I don't know. The MLB's change score change Twitter guy was like, it's probably not going to get changed, but whatever. We'll see. But the fact that Mookie beat it out and Gary Cole just didn't even attempt to cover first base. What are we doing? After that, it really, I was like, okay, that's on you. That's literally on, on you. Yeah. You so beat now, yourself. <laughs> yeah. And now you've got Freddie Freeman and say Oscar Hernandez, who both came up, got hits, knocked more runs in, and suddenly were tied all of the sudden with, and, and somehow also Gary Cole still has a zero ERA because these are all unearned runs. Mm-hmm. Yes. Why? Because the original error by Aaron Judge created essentially the onslaught of problems but it was fucking wild just wild obviously Garrett Cole's not gonna throw Aaron Judge under the bus but the fact that he didn't say yeah I should have covered first that's on me just absolutely blows my mind CJ Stroud the quarterback for the Texans is getting slaughtered slaughtered literally his O-line the guys that are like supposed to protect him so that he can throw the fucking ball Mm -hmm. not doing their jobs not doing their jobs in the last game apparently he was sacked like eight times he stood up there at the end of the game and said, yeah, that's on me. I need to do better. Sir, how are you going to get better? <laughs> like, you can't defend yourself out there. That's what your O-line is for. That's what I 
that's what I thought Garrett Cole might have done. Like I yeah, thought Garrett I mean, Cole that's, might have said, that's the up. champion mentality. It's you're always yeah. being introspective and looking at, even if it was not, we, we don't need to point the finger of blame directly at someone for each and every one of us to be able to look in retrospect at what we could have done differently and how we could have been better. And that's like a good rule for life, but especially if you want to play at that level. So yeah, that's interesting. I, I didn't get into a lot of the post game stuff for that particular game, but I'm surprised to hear, yeah, that there wasn't any immediate yeah. just like sense of ownership there, but how crazy that it, we can look back at this inning and really see that the two players that you probably thought would be like the reason the Yankees could win in Garrett Cole mm -hmm. and Aaron judge, like the, they are the X factors for the Yankees yep. that they, it, you could easily say they're exactly the reason why the Yankees won it for the Dodgers <laughs> instead. Yeek. Yeah, it was, it was insane. And it was back and forth. It was a back and forth game and all credit to the Dodgers for doing the work and digging themselves out of that hole because a five Oh deficit in the fifth inning is a very big hill to climb. I wouldn't say it's Mount Everest, but I would say that it's never been done. Yeah, it was the biggest you know? comeback in an el elimination game. It ended 76 with Jack Flaherty. Not Jack Flaherty, I'm sorry. Walker Bueller. With Walker Bueller coming out of the pen because Jack Flaherty only went, is it one and one third? I don't even know. Did they even let, I don't even remember. There for the, let me see. If they it was, the, yeah, one and a third. Mm -hmm. One and a third. Okay, so one and a third. Innings. So they had used and Bonda, Brassier, Kopech, Vesia, and Gratterall, and Trinan <laughs> by then. So you were yeah. literally, I was like, we're going to see Tommy Edmund pitch. Actually, the ninth inning <laughs> for the Dodgers at this point. Why not? But no, he did not have to because Walker Bueller was there. And I loved this mm -hmm. moment for him, Susie. For people who don't know, Walker Bueller has had, is one of the few players who has had two Tommy John surgeries and is still active and performing at the major league level some days more than others obviously his start in the world series was very effective and like vintage walker bueller and they were ready to capitalize on that and take the chance that he'd be in that zone again and fortunately he was here's the question that i have for you did you have you seen this going around he struck out austin wells in that ninth inning and there is a, a clip yeah. of what appears to be Austin Wells giving Walker Bueller the middle finger after he struck him out. Do you think that was intentional or was it just the way his hands came off, came off the bat? <laughs> I, I'm trying to think back of where they did they ever cross in minor leagues or anything like that. I, and I don't know if there's any like backstory. I don't know if that was like a, a real actual fuck you or if that was just yeah. like a a friendly fuck you we're gonna we'll talk about this in the off season and but do you do shit think he, give you shit. he did what he did it wasn't like a, something taken I, context. yeah no i think there was i think there was a bird i think there it was did look pretty yeah it did yeah. look pretty intentional it was fast so part of me is i don't know maybe that's just the way the way his hand came off the bat but it did look yeah. very adamant yeah the way that he yeah. did it yeah and those curveballs that he was throwing my goodness he was dotting those up again all credit to walker bueller because he came in and just shut him down i yeah, I thought I was it was impressed. cool too because you could see that the adrenaline was up and like the the intensity was there for him in a completely different way in those first few pitches. But then once yep. he got that first out, he just really was like, all right, I'm going to get the job done. So congrats to the Dodgers for winning the 2024 World Series. And some say now it's now you have a real one. I Not me. I'm saying you, that's your second. That is your second. You, you, the 2021 counts for me. But there are a lot of people out there that say the 2021 is a Mickey Mouse World Series and it doesn't belong and blah, 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 blah. Not me. Okay? Here's the you thing. It, it obviously counts, but it is different. They didn't win it the it same wasn't a, way. It wasn't, yeah. It wasn't so, a full 162 games. Yeah. We get it. But it, but it's not a construct of that the Dodgers did. You know what I'm saying? They won it. That was how that season was. The way that it was set up. They, mm -hmm. So they did the things. Again, I'm not saying that it's Mickey Mouse World Series. Dodgers fans, if you're listening to this, don't get mad at me. I am just reporting on what other people said. Congratulations on your second World Series. I do, however, have a question for you, though, Kels. 2020, they win the World Series. They don't get a parade. Mm -hmm. Okay? COVID happened. We get it. All that stuff. 2024, they win a World Series. They get a parade. Now, I have questions, Dodger fans. I, I need actual clarification on this because I tried to do some digging and I didn't come up with actual exact answers. So I need real boots on the ground fans to help me. 
as I was doing my research for this, I see that the total amount of people for the parade on the low side was 100,000 for the parade. And then on the high side was 225,000 people that showed up to the parade. I have so many questions for you, Dodger fans. What happened? Where were you? Is it traffic? Because I saw something about tickets being like you had to register for tickets or something. I don't think it was actually, I don't think you had to pay to go to the parade. I don't know if it was like a crowd control issue. So I, I, like, I am seriously wondering about this, but why were there so few people? Why were there so few fans at the World Series parade? Because I went back and checked on the last, how far, far back did I go? I think I went back to 2017 because 2017, when the Astros won it, it was reported that a million people in the city of Houston showed up for the parade. And I was like, that's a lot of fucking people. Okay. Then I went and I literally Googled all of the attendants for all of the World Series parades to see if I was just like not understanding the amount of people. And that's just like a, just a way lot of people showing up to a parade. And just maybe that's on me. Maybe that's on me for not knowing that. In the, let's see, the 2018 parade for the Boston Red Sox. Where are you, Boston Red Sox? I was in Boston the day of the the 2013 parade uh, because it was supposed to be either game, I think it was game six or game seven. Uh, and I went and met, I was living in New York. I took a bus down to meet my friends there from the Midwest. We were supposed to go to the Cardinals and the Red Sox World Series game, but the Red Sox had already beat the Cardinals. So I was there on parade day instead. And yeah, I would believe there was well over 200,000 people there. Okay, so apparently I don't have the Red Sox number for some reason, but apparently in 2021, when the Nats won the World Series, 800,000 people, more than 800,000 fans came out. And I was like, I'm so confused. I don't understand. Um, In 20, when the Astros won the World Series again, almost 2 million people showed up. So again, it's Texas, it's Houston, whatever. It's a lot of people. I get it. 300 to 400,000 when the Braves won it in 21. 400 to 700,000 people attended when it was in Arlington. So I just, I don't know why. Did you guys not want to deal with traffic? Was there a cap? Was there a limit? I have the questions and I need the answers. Yeah, I am guessing that accessibility was probably a big issue. I can only imagine. I thought I saw something too about how many more people showed up there though than they did for the Rams and other parades. So it seemed like for LA teams, Mm -hmm. there was a large turnout. And I would imagine, I haven't spent a lot of time in LA myself, but just thinking about the accessibility of things, like parking is a nightmare. You there's not a lot of places you can live in LA where you can you could no one could probably walk there. So I'm guessing accessibility was probably the main issue and maybe they did put a limit on it i really don't know but yeah if you're in the la area or you're a daughter's fan more immersed in the culture let us know what's the deal with that because i am seeing these like insane numbers of in 2004 when the red sox broke the curse the there were over three million people at their parade yeah just absolutely insane numbers for parade attendance and then i see 100 to 225 for LA and I was very confused because I like I said that's what I heard most about winning the World Series is that they didn't get a parade and they wanted a parade which I get yeah. it's good time totally it's yeah, time, yeah yeah right mm-hmm. but then the turnout is that few and I have so many more questions mm-hmm. this is not a slight on 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 Dodgers fans I just I need I want to know I need yeah to know. what's the deal what's the yeah. parade setup what are the challenges we're facing here because that does seem weird Yeah. So it was odd. And that was one of the things that just stuck out to me from the celebration and all of that stuff. And I was like, all right, that's, I need to talk about this because I have questions. Also, how much do you think Jack Flaherty drank at the parade and maybe before the parade? Because did you see that clip of him? (laughs) I did. Oh, Jay Flair. That's the kind of drunk you can only get if it's like your birthday or you're a World (laughs) Series champion, right? So especially day drunk. But good for him. Good for Jack. I'm glad he got to fully take in the moment. Maybe he would remember it a bit better, a bit more clearly, but seems like he was really enjoying himself. And what did you think about him so clearly stating that he never wants to leave? Because that's something that I've been seeing 
there was an interview with him at the parade of him saying, I love the city. He is, he's from LA. He obviously grew up a Dodgers fan. When he was on the Cardinals the whole time, everybody was like, just send him to LA. He clearly wants to be in LA, blah, blah, blah. And it's like, okay, he's from there. Like one, right. you can't blame him for that. But two, I, there's plenty of other reasons Cardinals fans wanted to hate on him that have nothing to do with how he plays baseball. And I, one of the things that I really like about him is that he does just really wear his heart on his sleeve. But in this scenario, do you think being that like open and not at all calculated and just saying something when he was clearly a little buzzed, do you think that's going to affect him at all in the offers that he gets this off season? I don't think so. I don't think so. I think his, his every other game being good is going to affect him just a little yeah, bit more yeah, than, absolutely. than his, statement on that there there have been lots of players that said that they want to go back to the Dodgers insert Kenley Jansen here <laughs> it's just it's one of those things he's a human being he's a person he has preferences yeah I don't that's fine so if he wants to go back to the Dodgers and the Dodgers are willing to pay him an amount that he's good with then hooray for you Jay Flair I just I don't know if he won himself some more money or if he lost himself more money is the problem because for a season overall look obviously he was a really good pitcher, one so good that the Yankees were going to get him and then said, JK, we don't want your medicals. That's what could have been for you, New York Yankees. Yeah, I do think that certain organizations, the Dodgers being at the very front of these organizations that are willing to invest more in players, especially pitchers like Jack Flaherty, because they feel like they have this advantage of rehabilitating or even just coaching players like him yeah so for that reason alone I wouldn't be surprised if he he sticks with them or an organization like them in terms of their approach to pitchers but we'll see it I don't know he'll be one of the interesting storylines among many to follow this offseason there's the big guys that we're all going to see oh who's gonna go where we all know that Blake Snell has opted out of his player option and you're like where are you gonna go Blake Snell, you going to stay on the West Coast? It's going to be most interesting to see for Blake Snell, like how differently it plays out than it did this past the offseason going into the 2024 season, right? Because that was just crazy. Obviously, you can go back. We talked a ton about it, how there were so many players, most namely the Scott Boris four that waited deep into the offseason and even into spring training to to sign with teams and that didn't play out particularly well for any of them. Blake Snell is probably on this, the side of it played out the best for him and still wasn't like particularly great. So I'm really interested to see how different the approach is. And if anything happens, is it going to happen really quick? I think it's definitely going to happen quicker for a number of those guys, but yeah, it's going to be really interesting, really fun to talk about. We have lots of things to discuss and obviously there are players playing in the Dominican winter league going on there. There's another baseball league going on right now too. That's not Dominican winter league. And I was so confused by it and I needed to do a little bit more research on that, but like rich Hill is one of the players playing oh. for said league. The it's, Arizona fall league is like, going too, so yeah. yeah, but it's not the Arizona fall league. Arizona fall league is for the, just for people that aren't aware, Arizona Fall League is for all of the major league teams to send their like top prospects to. I still don't understand how it's broken down by the because there because it doesn't follow any of the minor league groupings at all. It's just right. a random assortment of players that are grouped together into teams. But yeah, it's not the AFL. It's some other. It's like a, it's like the World Baseball Classic, but it's not because hmm. the, it's Team USA versus other countries. But it's not like the mm. actual world baseball we need class. to get rich but, hill we need to get rich yeah. hill on the show to talk about this yeah rich hill is one of the, the players that is on there i'm all are you still pitching rich hill but good for you we'll see what's going to happen and there's but there have also been hot stove moves stove is hot stove is stoving already and, you know already the world series ended and then they were like Beep, fyi here's a move jorge soler to the angels we talked about it kills we talked about alex anthopolis and his murder board Yes. What I don't exactly know what Alex Anthopoulos has over Perry Manesian of the Angels. He's got to have something, though. He's got to have something for all of these moves that Alex Anthopoulos has done for the Braves that have just been so lopsided in favor of the Braves. It does seem that way, but the Los Angeles Angels, I think, are one of those organizations that you can get away with a lot more than maybe some others. So I don't know if he had to be that strategic <laughs> with this one. I, so Dana Brown, the GM for the 
Houston Astros, Alex and Pablos, the GM for the Braves, and then Perry Manazian, the GM for the Angels, all got started together. Dana Brown brought them up together. So now I'm all, Dana Brown, can you get in on this blackmail? Please. I need, can we get Reed Detmers from the Angels for, I don't know, a pack of bubble gum and a shoelace? Yeah. What are we doing here? <laughs> That's what I want to happen. But I need to know what Alex Anthopoulos and his murder board are doing. Because as soon as the World Series ended, it was, okay, Jorge Soler to the Angels for Griffin Canning. And the Angels are taking on all of their salary, all of Jorge Soler's salary. Yeah, the entirety of Jorge Soler's salary in exchange for right-handed pitcher Griffin Canning. Atlanta was able to create $26 million of payroll flexibility over the next two years just with that move. Mm -hmm. Sounds pretty good. Yeah, it's actually insane is what that is. And yeah. next season, just FYI, people, I circle this, timestamp this, Griffin Canning. Because right now, I want to say Griffin Canning has a five or a six ERA. 5.19. Mark my words. Or 32 or 31 starts. Yep. Mark my words, Griffin Canning is going to be a sub three ERA next season. I was going to get in, in into the Braves lab and do whatever the things that they're doing. And it's going to be not to Chris Sale levels. Mark my words, Griffin Canning. You're going to be like, where did Griffin Canning come from? And we're going to tell you the angels. That's, mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. They could also choose to non-tender him, but I think he, they're going to do exactly what you just said. I think they're going to plug him into that rotation. And even if he's at the fourth or fifth guy, he could serve them very well. And I would not be surprised at all if we see exactly that. Yep. So other notable names that have opted out of their options, Randall Gritchick for the Arizona Diamondbacks, Jock Peterson for the Arizona Diamondbacks, did both declined their options, making them free agents. Eugenio Suarez opted, opted in. They said, hey, Eugenio Suarez, come on back, please. Merrill Kelly op optioned, excuse me, picked up his option as well. Jordan Montgomery, to nobody's surprise, said, oh, I'm sorry, Ken Kendrick, owner of the Diamondbacks. You thought it was a mistake for signing me, but guess what? You still have to pay me $22.5 million. Maybe Ken Kendrick, maybe we don't run our mouths. And I don't know. I feel bad for Jordan Montgomery, but hopefully he pitches better. And yeah, I, I do too. fires their entire pitching staff and maybe... Yeah, um, let's run that back and give Jay money on the Diamondbacks another shot in 2025, and I hope it looks very different. Yeah. I do. He signed what? He signed super late. He okay. signed like on opening day, I believe. Yeah. yeah. And I do think Hopefully. that he is one of those players. Obviously, we're going to talk a ton about Juan Soto being the, the number one client of Scott Boris, and that's going to be like the story of the offseason. But Jordan Montgomery was a Scott Boris client. He fired Scott Boris as his agent earlier on, like a few months ago. But I think the biggest thing, and I'm sure we'll talk about Juan Soto saying like he's available to all 30 teams and being like such a great little soldier for Scott Boras, is you have to be okay. Like you have to accept that you have to completely cut your emotions out of out of where you're going to be and any like personal preferences that, that you have if you you are going to let Scott Boras do your bidding for you. And I don't think Jordan Montgomery was in that position. And that was ultimately why it was not a fit, regardless of how you feel about Scott Boras that is the writing that is on the wall and that works for some guys. I think it will work very well for Juan Soto. I really do believe that he is in a place where just like his age, who he is as a person, like he's ready to just be like, put me wherever you're going to get me the most money and let's make break some records here, baby. But Jordan Montgomery was not in that situation. And I think that's a huge reason why it Correct. didn't work out. And unfortunately it really hurt his performance as well. I agree. I concur wholeheartedly. And did you see that scandal? come out with the Padres and the whole they found out that he was five years older than he really said he was yeah really, I don't want me to believe that Juan Soto no it's not Juan Soto but it was another yeah, another Dominican Republic player yeah which is obviously this is something that's been speculated with Albert Pujols and dealings in the Dominican for a long time and I love you want uh, me to believe that Juan Soto is 25 come on now people come on no I'm just kidding just kidding I do I, I don't know like part of me is does it matter that much like I get that it does totally in in the decision making yeah. and the kind of money that they're in the commitments that they're making to these guys but if it's like if it's a thing that we just know is something that's happening to some extent like just know that in the back of your mind it is what it is and you can it's just one of the many variables that you have to consider 
when making these kind of long-term deals. I don't know. And I'm sorry, but Albert Pujols, if Albert Pujols is five years older, if he's any older, if he's even a year or two older, he was still playing in the big leagues, hitting his 700th yeah. career home run when he was over 40 years old. And that's if he wasn't lying about his age. He might've been over 45 if he is actually the age that people have speculated he is. So whatever, like it's gonna work out one way or another. And again, use the, do with that information what you will. But I think it's like unfortunate that we have to keep hearing about it and that it's such a problem. But yeah, I did yeah. hear about that. And it I just, wonder it, how much more we'll hear about it with this. Signing. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, for sure. It was just one of those things where, you know, if I could raise one eyebrow, I would raise one eyebrow and look like that emoji. But I can't. Here I am just going to <laughs> describe it for Only you. Both. Yeah. <laughs> Only both. Only both. I'm like, oh, no. <laughs> no. If you're not watching on the YouTube, oh, this is reason oh. enough. Come on over. Watch me I'm and like, Susie. If I close oh. the one eye. I can do it, if, but it only works if I close the one eye into it. And that doesn't, my, that gives off a different vibe. My dad and my siblings and my husband too, they can all do those sorts of things. Like they can all wiggle their ears and oh, do all kinds okay. of fun things. And me as the actor here, I just didn't get any of those gifts. It's really not fair. Yeah. Apparently you can train yourself to wiggle your ears. I'm all, I don't think you can. I, how do you do that? So if any of you people that listen to us, put it in the YouTube comments, please. Subscribe, do all the things, and put it in the comments. How do you wiggle your ears? How do you train yourself to do that? I, train God, I just remember this is. I'm God. getting PTSD right now, Susie. You have all of us sitting around the table when I'm little, and my dad just being like, "I can wiggle my ears," and, and Katie and Jake can, can all wiggle their ears, and I'm just sitting there, like, "I can't do it though." <laughs> no, <laughs> if you could teach yourself, I would have because I felt very left out, <laughs> but I cannot do it. <laughs> you didn't try hard enough, Kelsey. You did not try hard enough, apparently. <laughs> So we'll see. We'll see if any of the if any of our listeners yeah, you are dedicated. Yourself, um, you fully believe you have taught yourself to wiggle your ears. Hit me up. <laughs> Let me know. Yeah, please. I would love that. One that I kind of want to talk about, mainly because it, it was bringing attention to the Houston Astros and what the Houston Astros are going to do. They were like, oh, yeah, it looks like Cody Bellinger is going to opt out of his deal. And we hear rumblings that the Houston Astros could sign. You shut the fuck up. Nope, 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 nope. Cody Bellinger said, I'm staying right here in Chicago. I don't know if he loves it. I'm going to say he loves it. I just didn't want him in Houston. $27.5 million. <laughs> yeah. You're not going to get that anywhere else, especially no. for the level of not... play that he's at. Yeah. He has a $25 million player option with them in 2026 as well. Like, yeah. he's smart <laughs> to stick with it at not this doing point. It. It's just, it's one of those things where I'm like, okay, Chicago, White Sox. The White Sox did not pick up Yuan Mankata's $25 million option. Yuan Mankata, free agent. I'm like, Juan, I don't think anyone's going to. Maybe somebody will pick him up on a very team-friendly deal. We shall yeah, see. There, he's probably not going to make anywhere close to $25 million next yeah. season. But he's not going to have to play on the White Sox next season. So we'll see. Yeah. <laughs> Win for him. Uh, Nick Martinez of the Cincinnati Reds exercised his uh, $12 million player option, and so now he is a free agent. There is, let's see, Hunter Runfro picked up his player option, $7.5 million for the, oh, guess what? It's time to take my medicine. It is for the Royals, picked up his player option. So, Hunter Renfro, we will see you back next season. The Royals declined to their end of the mutual option on Adam Frazier. So, bye-bye, no Adam Frazier. He gets a $2.5 million buyout for that. The Dodgers, what do you think the Dodgers did? Tell us. The Dodgers picked up Austin Barnes' option for $3.5 I think that was pretty obvious. Uh, they also picked up their club option on Miguel Rojas. Seemed like the writing was on the wall there. He's a big vibes fit for them as well, it seems. $5 million club option. That one kind of surprised and me, though. That one? Really? That one kind of surprised I, me. No, I don't fully get it, but there's some... Miguel Rojas is like the spirit animal of the Dodgers like what he's like or he's like the spirit spiritual leader of the Dodgers which I didn't see that I didn't have that on my baseball bingo card but he definitely is he I don't know if you yeah. guys noticed but he was giving speeches like when he was on when he was injured when he wasn't even playing in the postseason and Doc was waiting for him like Dave Roberts was like we can't start without we've got to pass the mic to to Miguel Rojas so there's something there he's the glue guy for that that team currently and he's been relatively versatile for them. He's one of those guys like Tommy Edmond, Chris Taylor, Kike Hernandez. You can put him, lump him into that of the guys who really are going to be the difference makers when, with how much is unpredictable in a season. So I guess I'm not surprised for that reason. The, the one thing I'm 
interested to see here is okay. Oh, Clayton Kershaw has a $15 million player option, 10 million with 5 million invested escalators based on games started in 2024. Clayton Kershaw has said he's coming back next year, but it's not official yet. But of course he's coming back, right? He's not going to get $15 million anywhere else. Correct. Yeah. And now he, in the off season, he had toe surgery and knee surgery. He pitched 30 innings in 2024. And while I don't know, happy to see him so happy celebrating (laughs) this World Series championship, I don't know that (laughs) I just felt like it was a little weird because I'm like, what? I'm glad you're excited. But honestly, it's not that different than like Max Scherzer celebrating so hard with the Rangers when I'm like, bro, you made six starts and most of them weren't good. But okay, (laughs) yeah, Yeah. (laughs) you get the ring. And I will I'll give Clayton Kershaw all all the credit because in his speech, he, he said that he's I know I didn't do anything, but I'm here for you know, like, I like yeah, and don't get me wrong, Clayton like Kershaw obviously has his place well carved out in the history books. And actually, while we're talking about him, Susie, I want to get on my soapbox because I something that's really pissing me off actually is it, yes, okay, I'll say this. It's weird that Clayton Kershaw and any of the guys, there are just certain guys that like always have their shirts off, and then uh, but there's <laughs> there's only like a few of them. It's not like a thing. Right. It's just like yeah. a hand, a small handful of them. But I am done. I am fucking done with the body shaming of Clayton Kershaw because (laughs) do you not understand? We have such a fucked up perspective of what a healthy, functionally strong man over 35 looks like. Okay. (laughs) Clayton Kershaw, if everyone in America looked remotely like him, we would all be really healthy and really strong. And I'm just like, I'm seeing all of the shame over his quote unquote dad bod. And I'm like, no wonder we all think we're fucking fat because this man as a professional athlete. And one of the things I actually love about baseball is first of all, it's definitely the most like functional of any of the like mainstream professional sports. So you're gonna see players that don't all look the same. Like all football players to some extent are like yoked and super huge. All basketball and soccer players are super lean. The amount of running and just cardio involved in the entire game from the second that the clock starts. But baseball players they they probably look the most different from person to person. Right. And that is representative of all of us as a society. The, the First of all, I, it, the n- number one thing is that it just blows my mind that so many people think that it's cool or like at all acceptable to comment on people's bodies in general. It's a weird right. fucking thing to me. If you want to comment on somebody's haircut or the clothes that they're wearing, totally fine. Those are things we're much more in control of, very choiceful things. But Clayton Kershaw is one of the best athletes of our generation. And it's the same, same shit that we hear all the time that people like to give Lance Lynn and even look like players like Alec Burleson on the, the Cardinals. I'm like, are you kidding me? Like they are professional athletes and a right. misunderstanding of what like healthy and strong looks like is the root of this problem. Because if the zombie apocalypse hits tomorrow, I can tell you what right. Clayton Kershaw and Alec Burleson are going to last a hell of a lot longer than the guys who you can see their six packs. And that's just, that's not because of anything other than they are more like functionally sound and strong And also Clayton Kershaw has been in, to your point, like recovery mode of where at least half of what they're eating and what they're doing is focused on recovery when you're a professional athlete. And they're going to recover a lot better. You want to look at guys like Tyler O'Neill and John Carlos Stan, who are super ripped and lean. They don't recover well because they don't have body fat. And that can be really problematic for their careers and really frustrating for fans. So I know that was a really long just all over the place but stop shaming Clayton Kershaw if again like healthy functional strong human being and good for him that he feels like he wants to take a shirt off some people don't like champagne soaked shirts exactly you know, Kevin yeah. Kiermaier also does not like champagne soaked shirts so I also I'm mad at all of you fans listeners that did not tag me in any shirtless Kevin Kiermaier pictures I'm very upset at y'all yeah, and, and Kevin the, Meyer has uh, – genetics are on his side. Genetics mm-hmm. is a really big part of yeah. – so I by no means saying that Kevin Kiermaier is not as functionally sound and healthy as Clayton Kershaw. I'm just saying it looks different on all of us. And yeah. leave. The, one, the one thing that I asked of y'all was to tag me in all of the shirtless Kevin Kiermaier pictures, and you guys failed. I had to go seek out those by myself. <sighs> it's just work you Very should Very disappointing. Have. You should not have no, to do. No. That's why, why I have a platform, have, people. I was going to say, why do we even have a podcast? God. Yeah. Yeah. Jesus. Anyhow, so <clears throat> the Clayton Kershaw obviously com- coming back next year. 
let's just be really honest. No one is factoring Clayton Kershaw into their actual pitcher profile. One yeah, of the starting pitchers. No. Like I don't. If it happens, great. I think it's one of those type of deals. If it happens, super. We love mm. that. Let's go, Clayton Kershaw. Let's end on the high note. If it doesn't, I don't think they are in any sort of panic. So we'll see what that starting rotation does actually look like since Walker Bueller and Jack Flaherty are free agents. And we will talk about that more in the offseason. The New York Yankees on the other side, Luke Weaver, obviously the Yankees picked up his very affordable two and a half million dollar club option. And we'll see if the closing thing actually sticks with him. I think it will. Yeah, Luke you know, Weaver. Shout like, out to Luke Weaver, the most used and abused guy mm-hmm. in the World Series. But he he held up his end of the bargain as far as I'm concerned by the oh, point yeah. that they brought him in in that game five. I'm just like, man, you have asked so much of him. And you get what you get yeah. at that point. Yep, absolutely. Again, being a quote-unquote failed starter, the fact that he does have more than two pitches, I think bodes very well for a quote-unquote lockdown closer. And he's got some really good stuff. So we'll see if that translates into next season. I hope it does because, again, we love our jungle cat, Luke Weaver. The energy and the vibes that he brings to the Yankees, it's just, why does it have to be the Yankees? Yeah. Anyhow. Anthony Rizzo, however, they said, sorry, Riz, you didn't run to first base. We are not picking up. No, that's not what they said. But I didn't think that they were going to pick up his option anyways. So they declined their club option, and he receives a $6 million buyout and becomes a free agent. Do you think that Anthony Rizzo gets picked up by a club? He's 35, I think, right? 35-year-old first baseman? Yeah, he definitely will. At this point, not going to be, obviously, anything. I'm sure it'll be year to year. But yes, I think he will be one of those that we'll see slide in as a backup first baseman DH option closer to the start of spring training. Yeah, I don't think think Anthony Rizzo's done by any means, yeah. but 17 million would have been a lot <laughs> for Anthony Rizzo at the stage of his career. The big one though, for the New York Yankees, the one that apparently created headlines was Garrett Cole opting out of his contract. But we all know that the Yankees can tack on a, a fifth year. And if the Yankees do that, then you'll have Garrett Cole on the Yankees for five more years. Yeah. I, I don't know. This didn't come as a surprise to me. It was pretty obvious. This is just part mm-hmm. of the game. That's, this yeah. is what we're doing. Garrett Cole has to opt out. So the Yankees have to opt in so that he can get $36 million more guaranteed because he had a relatively good year. That's what we're doing here. What do you think happens if the Yankees shock the world and say, we're good? There I'm is no way. Cole, no, there is no way. That will not happen, especially with where they're currently at. I know he's 34 years old. By the, by the way, he's another one. If he took a shirt off, he'd look just like Clayton Kershaw. Uh, <laughs> but yeah. No, he's such a staple of that organization and he's still got the stuff. There's no reason. I I think he's worth it, honestly. All right. Let's see. We have got Diego Padres. Yeah, I was going to say, let's talk about Ha-Sung Kim because he exercised his end of the mutual option to become a free agent. So he will get a $2 million buyout from the Padres. But Ha-Sung Kim is now a free agent, baby. And he was probably one of the more underpaid, underappreciated players as it is the last couple of seasons, mm-hmm. who is going to get Hassan yes. Kim? I can't wait to see. Hopefully, the Astros. I don't know where we can put them. Maybe third. Would mind. I would absolutely would immediately get a Kim jersey, right? I feel like immediately. I would get a Kim jersey. Immediately get a Hassan Kim jersey. 1,000%. I may even learn Korean so that I can converse with Hassan Kim. I, that's, that is what I would do for Hassan Kim. I would actually really love that. The fact that Alex Bregman is obviously a free agent, so we are losing our third baseman. We don't have a first baseman, apparently, that we want to pay and play there all of the time. Our center fielder sucks. We have lots of holes in the Houston Astros. So I would love Hassan Kim to be part of this team. I also want them to sign Yusei Kikuchi for Japanese pipeline reasons, but that is neither here nor there. I But I would like some sort of Asian on my favorite baseball team. Please and thank you, Houston Astros. If you listen to this, I don't know if you do. I know some of your players do. That's all I'm saying. So any of the players or wives that are listening to this just drop a little little crumb i love that one of the things that i found funny i was like of course robbie ray robbie ray opted into his contract for the san francisco giants surprise blake snell where are you going blake snell i really i I want to know where blake snell is going 
So he had a $38.5 million player option, 15 million of 2025 salary deferred until 2027. Not exactly the equivalent of a full 38.5 million in 2025 because a good portion of that was deferred. But still, I don't know. I think it's because of his age. He's going to go for go into this offseason looking for as much of a long-term deal to secure as much because what he's in his early 30s now. Mm-hmm. He's 32, um, is, right? 31? Yeah, he's not quite as old as Garrett Cole, I think, but definitely yeah. looking to get some years under his belt at this point. So we shall see where Blake Snell ends up. Jorge Polanco. Jorge Polanco for the Seattle Mariners. The Mariners said, thank you, but no thank you, Jorge Polanco. And the ever-revolving door at second base for the Seattle Mariners continue. (laughs) So he had a $12 million club option with a $750,000 buyout. So Jorge Polanco gets $750,000, which is essentially just a regular old contract salary. Um, And we'll see where Jorge Polanco ends up next season. You want to talk about the uh, which cards are doing, Kels? Well, the Cardinals are going into full-on rebuild, mo- rebuild mode. They won't say it, so I will say it for them. Uh, they have declines uh, Keenan Middleton's option, which who's Keenan Middleton? You wouldn't know because he did not pitch an inning for the Cardinals in 2024, and he won't in 2025 either unless he wants to agree to get paid less than that $6 million club option that they declined. They also declined starters Lance Lynn and Kyle Gibson's options for 11 and $12 million, respectively. They will each get a $1 million buyout. And I don't know, the writing was on the wall in terms of what the Cardinals have expressed their their approach going into 2025 is going to be. But I think we did think that there was a better chance that they would keep Kyle Gibson around because of the regression with Lance Lynn is more, is the writing is more on the wall than it is with Kyle Gibson. Right. Right. And there definitely could have been some trade value there with Kyle Gibson that I think we expected that they could potentially hold on to and play around with, but yeah, no, the Cardinals are are pinching all the pennies and you're going to see a bunch of guys in the rotation that you most likely have never heard of, or we wish you had never heard of next season Uh, (laughs) because they were just not trying to be competitive, which is, really sad and really silly to some extent, like what it, what is being done needs to be done to some extent. But the thing that I have not been very openly critical of, and I'm really just starting to reach a frustrating point with is the fact that the Cardinals don't spend a ton of money in free agency. They never really have, but they're always like right middle of the road in payroll. Mm -hmm. Um, but, and, and that's all fine. I think there's, there's a sustainability approach in winning that I appreciate that they have and that they don't go out and just sign these outrageous contracts for the sake of having these big names and everything. And that they are the right level of strategic with it. But the thing to remember as the Cardinals are now very much seemingly taking a Tampa Bay Rays approach for the next couple of seasons, most likely is that the Cardinals are not like the Tampa Bay Rays because the Cardinals sell a lot of tickets and they make a lot of money and they have the third richest owners in all baseball. So it's frustrating for that reason. That being said, I do think we're, since we're stripping away all the money here, we're going to see a lot of strategy with High and Bloom now being moved into the, the general manager role and ultimately into the president of baseball ops role after this coming season. So yeah, the big news is Lance Lynn and Kyle Gibson are free agents again. What team is going to pick them up for 2025? I will give Heim Bloom some credit, though, because Heim Bloom getting fired from the Red Sox, he overhauled the Red Sox minor league system. And now the Red Sox are set up with their minor league system to be really pretty good. There's a lot of prospects that are coming up that are supposed to be big deals for them. And I know that was a little, I say a little bit. I guess part of the issue with the Cardinals, obviously you would know better yes. than I. Yeah. Um, oh, definitely. There, was, there just seemed like there was no... Yeah, player development. I don't want to say no talent coming up, but the player development wasn't there. Needs a major overhaul for sure. And But it doesn't take a mathematical genius, which I by no means am, to know that the, the cost of putting into player development and kind of restructuring that is not at all equivalent to... The, this money that they're not going to spend on free agents like right. the things there and they're saying we're investing more in this so we're going to spend less money here and it's that's just no like the costs are not right. even comparable and I, my frustration or I guess my, my critique as a fan of the team at this point is I get it what's being done needs to be done but 
you didn't, you don't have to save all your money at the same time. You don't have to zip the pocketbook shut. Uh, but that is what's happening. So the, we're going to see a very different St. Louis Cardinals organization over the next couple of years. That's for sure. Yeah. Again, we'll talk about a lot of that in the off season. These are just the more major ish moves. Tampa Bay, the Brandon Lau, because it's Josh Lowe and Brandon Lau. Brandon Lau, uh, the Rays picked up his $10.5 million club option. The second baseman? First baseman. First baseman for the Tampa Bay Rays will be staying there. We don't know where the Tampa Bay Rays will be playing. However, that's, again, we will talk about more in the offseason. But the roof is just a non-starter and they don't have any drainage. So they can't be, they can't play there. So we'll see. The yeah. Texas Rangers... David Robertson, which I believe his is, is his own agent. Is yes, he is. What is that one? Okay, so I was like, it's one of their closers. It's either David Robertson or it Kirby is David Gates, Robertson. So, and yeah. He's moving David, on. yeah. So David Robertson exercises his option to become a free agent and collects his one and a half million dollar buyout. So that will be interesting because there's quite a few teams that are in need a, of a closer, and he had some really oh, good yeah. numbers this season. So I mean, every all of those. Season. Could use a, a relief pitcher like David Robertson. Absolutely. Yeah. All of these numbers that we have told you about, all of those stats come from our good friends over at justbaseball.com. That was a that's a fun article that I believe they are updating. Yes, well, they're doing probably the best season. job of anywhere that I have found of keeping it up to date and making it really digestible. So we can link yep. that in the show notes and point you in that direction for the latest. Definitely. Definitely for sure. I also have a question for you, Kels, and maybe a bone to pick again with our listeners are in and our lovely people that tune into us. Did you know, Kels, that there is a sexiest podcast host award in People magazine? What? <laughs> I did not know. Yeah. I did know. I did know that they're about to, they're doing like the sexiest man alive issue soon. So that's all about to come out and we're probably going to have to go up against that with our sexiest Major League Baseball players alive episode or something like that. We can definitely do that. We can yeah. definitely do that. But some, there some is hitting off season <laughs> for sure, for sure. And when we're not talking about the hard hitting issues, but there is a category of sexiest podcast hosts that we a we're not aware of. Yeah. But b I got my feelings hurt because no one nominated us. What are we doing here, people? The that our actual... voices are not sexy enough. Yeah. Like, what are what is the <laughs> the actual winners of the What's sexiest podcast what? hosts, Jason and Travis Kelsey, I don't understand. What's what do they have that Kelsey and I don't have? That's great. A great mustache. Great I facial can hair. Try. Can't even go up against that. I typically try and wax mine off, but for the sake of <laughs> trying to win this, this is category, what the people want. I mean, I, <laughs> I can do that. I just. My feelings are hurt, people. My feelings are hurt. No, I'm just kidding. I but I was listening to I was listening to Travis and Jason Kelsey's podcast, and apparently they won that category. And it it made a made me laugh, but then B hurt my feelings. We weren't nominated, and that I didn't even know about said category. And but it was one of those things where it cracked me up that Jason and Travis Kelsey here they are. Now we know, and we can set our sights on 2025. If I need to make my voice sexier, I can probably do that. I don't know, listeners. Tell us where is it the voice. That's the only thing I'm really willing to change. So, yeah, I don't think it's anything else, Kelsey. I don't. It's it just definitely possibly. not our looks. <laughs> For sure not. Nope. Mm -mm, absolutely not. So, again, well, just if you've been listening this far, I'm not open to I'm not open to comments on my looks, mine or Clayton Kershaw's. So save it. <laughs> I'm only open to comments on my voice. I'm not open on any on anything. So I'm perfect the way that I am. Don't are, I'm not changing anything. <laughs> And we all know that, but this is why God made me the way that I am. Because if he did make me the quote unquote stunner norm, like that you see, I would be a menace and you all would be living in Suzlandia. Just, I'm aware of this fact. All right. I just, I know this about me. I know that if God gave me boobs and the ability to do math, it's over. It's over for it all y'all. over for all of us. I'm glad that we can live com at least somewhat comfortably in your presence. I do appreciate that. Yep. Yeah. You're welcome. You are welcome. God knew. He's all no, absolutely not. That one, she's going to be mildly funny to make up for the lack of boobs. That's what that one is going to do. No, we know. We know. He knew what he was doing. He knew. It's all right. Oh, I'm, and we're going to make her Asian, but not good at math because 
God said, I am a funny motherfucker. That's <laughs> that is also what he said. Breaking so, stereotypes all over the place. All over the place. All over the place. Again, he knew what he was doing because again, this is not a math pod. I am not that Asian. But he gave me a child that loves math, Kelsey. He gave me a child that loves math and was just one. Just just one. Just one. Out of the two. He gave me a child that loves math and was voluntarily doing long division when they had not learned about long division in their actual class. And she's over here voluntarily doing long division. Yes, I would and then Mm-mm. yeah. And then sobbing because as I'm trying to remember how to do long division because <laughs> does long division these days, not me. Not with a, without a calculator. I'm over here trying to remember my how do I what am I doing with the go to the two goes where with the dropping of the no, no. So that's God has a sense of humor when that shit happens. When that shit happens. Also, God has a sense of humor when he lets the LA Dodgers win the 2024 World Series. I was about to say Super Bowl. 2024 World Series. <laughs> they, have no. he, they, they have, have done, done it. They have done it. And Agar will. I don't think it's what any of us, if you're not a Dodgers fan, I don't think there's many other baseball fans who were like, yeah, you know what? But if my team doesn't make it, that's the team I'd like to see. But the good news about the Dodgers is that they do have a lot of pieces that are easy to root for. They, as an organization, they are run extremely well. It's annoying that they have the amount of money that they do to flex, but they're not just writing the checks. They have a lot of other things to back it up. And that is why I am okay to congratulate them and and come full circle here and say, congrats to the 2024 Los Angeles Dodgers World Series champions, but mostly Tommy Edmond, World Series champion. Definitely, definitely Tommy Edmond. We love you, Tommy Edmond. Freddie Freeman. Hats off, sir. Hats off because we all knew about your high ankle sprain. We all knew about that. But what we did not know, Kelsey, was about the broken rib cartilage before any of this. Did you hear about that? Yeah. Did you read that story? Yeah. I've never had a broken bone. I've never had any of those things. And so I had to look up, like, I was like, why didn't you just say broken rib? Because it's not a broken rib. It was like the cartilage inside the rib. And I was very confused on that. And I'm all, what does that mean? What does that do? Apparently... It hurts. It hurts all of the things. And so now it makes way more sense when Freddie Freeman was saying that he was getting to the yard four hours early and getting all of this thing. I was like, what are you doing on your ankle for four hours, bro? Right. They were even on some of the broadcast where they were like, you don't understand what he's doing to get here and having all these people work on his ankle. And I'm like, it ain't just his ankle. But the thing is with, yeah, with those sorts of injuries, it's never just one thing that that you can really work on there. And there's a reason why his ankle got injured to begin with. And that was certainly yeah. part of it. But the fact that the broken rib cartilage happened the beginning of October, I was like, sir, are you kidding me? Are you actually kidding me? So the fact that he was Superman for the last week of October, congrats, Freddie Freeman. Congrats, because you are literally an Iron Man. You are a Superman. And it could not have happened to a nicer guy. It yeah. could not have happened to a nicer guy. I don't know. If he wasn't the MVP, if he didn't, hit all those home runs and was like the clear MVP who would have been the world series MVP. It wasn't close. There was no one else really who, I mean, Tommy Edmond probably had the highest yeah. base percentage of any of the guys in that lineup. Cause I know, as you pointed out to me, like fundamentally you look at the stats of the run scored, the home runs hit mm-hmm. the batting average and neither team did particularly well, but the Yankees actually did better in terms of statistics of who should have won that series, but uh, and everything, but run scored really, which is why they yeah. ultimately did not win that series or even push it longer than it needed to go. But I'm almost thinking like probably Walker Bueller because his start was probably the most impactful. And obviously then he came in and closed out that game. I don't know. I don't know who else it could have been. Yeah. I think you're probably, I think you're probably looking at one of those two. Yeah. I don't know. Like Trenton also maybe. Yeah. Could have some input there, but there's, I'm going to tip my cap begrudgingly say nice things about the Dodgers begrudgingly because if you're not watching on the YouTube you should probably be watching on the YouTube because I'm making super awesome faces right now but the bullpen moves that Dave Roberts made worked well and the fact that he put in the players that needed to be in there there there's some noise to be made about why wasn't Eddie Pajas in for longer or for more games Gavin Lux was still there it is what it is congrats 2024 world season world series 
champions, the Los Angeles Dodgers. Hooray! And Shohei Wait, didn't even do shit. <laughs> right. And Shohei oh, didn't even do shit. I get it. I'm glad. Nonetheless, I'm glad that Shohei Otani is a World Series champion. He obviously deserves that title as much as anyone. But I just thought it was really funny that, yeah, like immediately all of the graphics were like Shohei Otani and the World Series trophy. And I'm like, yeah, he really, really clinched that one i do have some mm-hmm. breaking news yeah. here Susie. before we wrap this up right-hander michael waka and the kansas city royals are in agreement on a three-year 51 million dollar contract so uh, not only is he's going to technically opt out of what was his 16 million dollar option he is going in with a new three-year 51 million dollar deal that also includes a club option and can max out at four years of 72 million get your bag michael waka i love this i love that for you and i love that it's for the kansas city royals And hopefully the Kansas City Royals continue to build and continue to get a couple of bats because let's be really honest, that's what hurt them. Mm -hmm. That's what hurt them, that they couldn't go farther. That and Bobby Witt disappearing, but that's neither here nor there. I think now that he's got some playoff experience, maybe the lights won't be as bright next time. We shall see. But hopefully the Kansas City Royals can do the moves and get the players and become a little bit more competitive because i would love to see a kansas city royals team knock off not maybe not the houston astros but like anybody else (laughs) yeah i'm absolutely here for that al central continuing to be very competitive and exciting a juggernaut a juggernaut that the the new york yankees beat in order to reach the world series Astros, I have a bone to pick with you, but that's going to be for the Houston Astros edition of Bourbon and Baseball. You're going to have to tune in to, for Tom and I to hear all of those rants because not everybody wants to hear about the Houston Astros, which I don't understand why, but whatever. That's fine. That's fine. So with that, Kels, if they would like to tell you how to wiggle their ears, yes. how to train your ears to wiggle, how can they find you on social media to tell you that? Yes. For those of us who weren't given these God-given talents, if you were able to Teach yourself to wiggle your ears at me at K Bird Tweets, K B U R D Tweets on the Twitter. My solo podcast, Peace, Love, and Baseball, comes out weekly on Tuesdays, which you can find uh, on any podcast platform on YouTube or just by following me on Twitter and finding the link tree. So when I'm not here, I'm there. Where can they find us, Susie? They can find Bourbon and Baseball on all of the platforms on the YouTubes, obviously, here. Like this episode, subscribe to the channel, please. And thank you. We have hit 257 i think subscribers on the youtubes guys thank you so much for subscribing we appreciate you guys on the audio side if you guys are listening via podcast only we would appreciate any and all ratings five star ratings reviews actual words typed saying nice things about us we would love that and tell your friends if there is a lady in your life that you would like to get interested in baseball send her our yeah, this, way this might be a good place to start and i think uh, honestly Susie, hot take here i think our off season episodes might be the best some of the best stuff that we put out because we do have some fun segments that we'll bring back and i think we're going to cover it in a way that's more than just like spewing information at you and we'll have mm-hmm. fun engaging takes and we like to hear from your takes and bring them up as well so join in on mm-hmm. the combo Yeah, we are. I feel like we're the best of both worlds, Kels. We can dive in on the quote unquote number side, the statistics Uh side. We understand. We like all that stuff. We can break that down for the newbies or the people that aren't so interested. But then we also talk about the fun stuff like the vibes and the sexiest player alive. And we like to have a little fun here. And I think we can give the best of both worlds. If you have a lady in your life that you want to get involved into baseball, you're like, hey, you know what? I got a podcast you should listen to. It's a lot of fun. Do it. Send her our way. With that said, we are going to go ahead and wrap it up and say, yay, baseball. Maybe it's end recording, but it's not doing anything else.